Hi, welcome to the Virtual Visiting Artists series here from UTA in the Department of Art and Art History. My name is Angela Callis and I am uh, very pleased to welcome Anthony Sonnenberg to, to give us a little in, introductory uh, um, explanation of his work and his practice. Um, Anthony is uh, He's currently living in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where he's been a visiting assistant professor at the University of Arkansas. Um, he received his MFA in sculpture from the University of Washington, Seattle in 2012. He's been an invited lecturer at institutions throughout the country, including at Pilchuck Glass School, University of Texas at Austin, Maine College of Art, California State University, Long Beach, and Pratt MWP College of Art and Design in New York. He's also participated in artist residencies throughout the country in California, Texas, New York, Michigan, Montana, and Washington State. His art has been exhibited in numerous solo and group exhibitions and can be found in several prestigious private and public collections, including the Crystal Bridges Museum. Uh, Anthony was uh, one of the uh, artists shown in the state of the art um, survey last year, which I saw, and that was about the last thing I did before everything shut down back last February. Um, and that is a survey of contemporary art made in America from all over the country. It's a very uh, prestigious um, thing to be invited to participate in that. Um, if you uh, if you would like to see any of Anthony's work. Um, locally, you can see his work at Conduit Gallery, where he's a represented artist. And he's also preparing for several solo shows coming up in the next year, including at Mindy Solomon Gallery. And that's in New York, right, Tony? The one uh, in, Miami. Oh, in, in Miami. And also at the Gavlak Gallery, which is in both LA and, and uh, in Palm Beach. And it'll be at the Florida Gallery. And he's going to be a uh, resident artist at Hendrix College, and that's going to be in the fall, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, now I'm going to switch over here. Make this big. All right. And I believe you you are on. Are you? Okay. Okay. So you guys, I would love. To, I'm pleased to introduce Anthony Sonnenberg. Hello, everyone. Give me one second while I navigate to my slideshow here. OK. OK, okay so um, thank you so much, Angela, for that great introduction. Uh, it kind of just reminded me, I'm like, oh, yeah, I got a lot of work ahead of me that I still need to do. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's good to be busy in these times, for sure. Um, and just thank you so much for, uh, to you and to Matt Clark and to UTA for inviting me to be able to talk to your students and for all those people that are watching today or who will be watching in the future because I know this gets recorded. Um, it's just such an honor to be here and I'm so glad I get to share my work with you guys and feel kind of a part of another group in these weird times of being alone together, whatever, whatever that means. Whatever that means. Uh, so uh, just to get started, this is kind of a first piece that I, I usually show in artist talks. It's one of the first things I made when I went to grad school and kind of one of the uh, things as far back as I am willing to go and still show you work. So I kind of like to start here. Um, a lot of, I, I really, this is kind of also maybe the last piece where I actually use taxidermy. So in another way, it's kind of the end of an era for me and kind of a beginning of I don't know, the last 10 years of work that um, I kind of think about as like my main represent body of work that I'm kind of going back to and thinking about a lot. Um, so the work is um, pretty complicated. Uh, there's a lot of intersections going on between a lot of different things. Um, and sometimes I get lost in it. So uh, one day I was on Instagram and, uh, you know, there's a lot of memes going around there that kind of use uh, Venn diagrams to make jokes about the, you know, different kind of pop icon things coming together or, or sharing um, causes or, or whatever. And so I thought, oh, maybe that'll be a good um, tool to kind of give you an overview of what I'm going to be talking about. So um, when I get into it and kind of get going, it, it might help you kind of keep track of where we are. So. Um, I think the easiest way that I've come to think about my work is there's kind of four main themes or, or polarities kind of going on. 
um, beauty, time, death, and desire. Um, and where those things often overlap is where a lot of like my interest in kind of themes and um, subject matter and stuff like that come out. So um, I wish I had a corner in here, but you can kind of see like in between desire and beauty, um, power and control, glitz and glam, jewelry, where I'm thinking about jewelry, a lot of my thinking kind of comes out of this sector of this paragraph. Um, and a lot of that also, you know, so where do beauty and desire and death all come over for me? Well, a lot of times I think about queerness, fear, fear for my body, um, fear of weakness or seeming weak or, or, or being an, uh, an object of weakness. Um, flowers are here between death and desire. We'll talk about flowers a lot. Um, Rococo, which we, we will see referenced a lot, um, is kind of conveniently, you know, this was an interesting thing. This is actually my third draft of one of these graphs, and I learned something very interesting for myself to know while making this that, like, while putting out these sectors, my body, which is a very constant term, and then our subject in my work, and then the Rococo theme, which has supplied a lot of the kind of aesthetic um, uniting factors throughout the work. Um, exists in the same kind of sector between beauty, time, and death. Um, so sincerity, we'll talk a lot. Craft is kind of in here between beauty and time. Um, so uh, yeah, and I, it's actually a project that I'm giving to my beginning collaborative thinking students as a way of kind of bridging um, from the visual to the verbal <laughs> for artist statements. Um, but anyways, if, you, if you're looking at this, this hopefully this will kind of maybe, if you're also, this is getting recorded, you can refer back to this if you should ever get lost um, in the kind of stream that's going to start. Um, so I'm going to start with influences first, kind of major influences in my journey uh, as those grew and changed and built, you know, kind of built one upon the other. Um, and the first person I always generally start with is Bernini. Um, he was really kind of one of the first true art icons for me, meaning that when I saw his work and learned more about his methods and his context and where and how and why the work was being made, there was just a real um, galvanizing feeling of being like, ooh, this is, this is where I want to go and what I want to do. And, and this aesthetic, even before I kind of understood who Bernini was, was always something very early on that really got me kind of my heart pumping and I had a real just um, knee-jerk reaction to like. And I think a lot of like my journey through undergrad and grad and kind of thereafter was figuring out a lot, you know, what exactly about that aesthetic did I like and how far could I go in recreating it? And, and when I recreate it in my own context, you know, what can I bring up? Um, but I think some things that are important to note about him moving on there is just kind of, um, seeing the use of beauty and drama and um you know kind of theatrical tricks of light and gold and shine and surface you know of, of marble um to kind of elicit hopefully either you know recording aesthetic experiences or bringing about aesthetic experiences and then also learning about you know this connection to baroque and Rome and how these churches and these things that are building this time was a very focused, weaponized choice that the church was making um, to fight in a very kind of soft war along with the real war kind of, uh, you know, anti-Protestism and, um, and the counter-reformation and all that kind of stuff. And so it just was really interesting to me to kind of see that beauty and power and politics um, were all together and that beauty was perhaps not as banal or um, innocent as maybe I had thought kind of earlier in my years. Um, another kind of really important influence for me um, is the still life, which is, you know, one of the oldest, um, I'm turning on my alarm so I can make sure I keep on time here, excuse me guys. Um, Both visually and structurally, the still life has been something that I think has always been there from the beginning. So, and first off, is there also a neat direct reaction of, of kind of liking and where the still life I think really comes in and points for me is, is the flower. Um, that's probably one of the most consistent and omnipresent visual elements of all my work. On um, almost every element, there is a flower involved. Um, and I think 
I still think a lot about what what the reasons for that are, but um, flowers do a lot of work for me, kind of in my mind. They um, do a lot of representation of what beauty is. I, ha I just find them so beautiful, but um, I also, there's something, you know, historically also about flowers is they are, they are so beautiful, but they are also um, short-lived. So this association of like beauty and the shortness of beauty and how that can be a metaphor for the body, which I think, you know, comes back a lot. Um, also, I'm from North Texas. I grew up in Graham, which is about two and a half hours away from where you guys are now. Um, and as you know, our climate's very harsh. We have maybe a nice spring where you can get some flowers going and then the, and the summer comes and it's just like like a heat death ray and everything just dies. And I just remember there would be like times in the summer where I'd just be like, it'd be so hot. I'd be like, how can anything possibly live? Like, how, how is this even possible? So um, I think, you know, flowers were really early and gardening and, and that kind of part of like, you know, nature um, and the cycle of life there and seeing it so harshly and so quickly and so like constantly repeated, we'd always plant these flowers in the spring and I would be so happy and love them. And, and then as soon as the summer came, they would go away. So I think that really kind of set up a real relationship in my mind between kind of beauty and death and desire and the shortness of times of those things and, and, and trying to focus on the beauty while you can, but also, you know, recognizing the kind of tragic nature of it because it don't go away. Um, so there's a lot of thoughts about <laughs> um, the still life, but I also was kind of talking about the structure in that once I started getting past just the aesthetic appeal for they hand for me and thinking more about what, why are they, how are they, what were they doing in their context, um, I kind of looked at this artist here on the right who is named Rachel uh, Rausch, uh, who is a 16th century Dutch painter, one of the very few rare women artists um, in the classic period, um, even rarer that she was um, recognized at the top of her profession as a flower painter. Famously, she was a contemporary of um, Rembrandt and her paintings sold more and for more and more than Rembrandt's painting. So it can kind of give you an idea of like her importance with these flowers, um, but also kind of understanding where they sit in kind of the Dutch thing of life about the Dutch and their trading and their rocket rise to, to wealth and money, and then kind of the fall of it too when the English and the French try to take it away from them. Um, I think put these things in a very interesting context for me and that they seem to be kind of advertising decadence and luxury and, de and those kind of things. But in the eyes of the Dutch, they were also very much um, memento moris, reminders of death. Um, and one of the things that I think really unlocked them for me in the understanding how that worked was remembering that in this time, flowers and what flower, where flowers, what, what flowers were in your life at what time was strictly dependent on the seasons. Now we don't know that because um, we can get flowers from anywhere in the world um, and we can have any flower at any time pretty much as long as you're willing to pay for it and you have it shipped to you. Um, but in these times, you know, there would be no way that plums would be fully fruited at the same time that a daffodil is blooming. That's, you know, six months apart. Um, and the people in that time would have known that. And so they would have known from the beginning that these were dreams, that these were fantasies in a, in a very real way for them that we don't see. Um, so just, just that kind of push and pull and, and the seeing of something looking like it is on the surface, but then you learn that in its essence, it's very much different than that. And seeing, you know, and seeing that reflected in life and my experiences in life and, and, and those kind of things were um, really important to me. I pay a lot of, you know, homage back to the work. Um, and then just very quickly, this image on the left is by David LaChapelle, who is most known for being a fashion photographer. He worked a lot with Vogue, still works a lot with Vogue. Um, it's kind of important to me because he's one of the first places where I saw kind of um, interesting queer, kind of erotic Amanda Lepore culture coming to me in my little small town of Graham. So I knew his work because of that, but then very later in my grad school career, I stumbled on these images of these still lives, which I'm really kind of fascinated with because on the surface, they look very much like these Rachel Rausch paintings, you know, and subject and then the amount of the kind of detail and the, and the jewel-like quality of the image are very much the same, but then um, where 
LaChapelle puts in the fantasy is the grease and the dirt and the edges of it all and his kind of referencing of pulp culture in the back and rotten fruit with um, Vienna sausage, <laughs> which, you know, could be a feast, but um, maybe not the feast that you had in mind. Um, so just the way that he was able to still play with dreams and play with fantasies, but but have those dreams kind of tick from happy to, to from happy to tragic um, in the same image as your eye moves through it and how he does that was also a kind of big influence on me and kind of a function that I try to have go throughout my work too. Um, I added this in, I'm actually doing a talk with this, with this artist tomorrow um, for Crystal Bridges, um, but this artist, Jeffrey Mitchell, was also a huge influence on me. After I got out of grad school, I went, he was on my committee and kind of helped me in my last year of grad school and then also hired me to work in a studio and was a very kind of important lifeline in learning and, and traditional character in my life because he, he really kind of helped help me understand how my aesthetic and my desire to make my work and where my work could be and how that exists in the real world and outside of academia. Um, and just giving me a lot of tips about like not having to make everything big and glitzy, um, letting sincerity and kindness and cute and clumsy and um, nostalgia and these kind of things were in his work unashamed and unabashedly, um, which is not something that always, at least in my perspective, comes into the art a lot, especially when it's kind of in the higher upper fields, but just seeing him work and getting to work with him and see how he made that possible in a way that was not kind of abstract, maybe this will happen one day, but he had been doing it for years. And also he's a very, he's, he's much older than me. He's in his sixties. So he just had so much perspective about what making an art in the career could be that I just really <laughs> was inspired by and kind of see myself as kind of carrying on in his legacy, even though he, you know, he's still very much alive and very creative and, and working a lot, but um, a very kind of also important person in, in teaching me, showing me kind of the future for the artist that I wanted to be. Um, this image right here is kind of to denote Rococo, which you saw in my, my Venn diagram. Um, and this is just kind of, it's a tail end little cousin part of the Baroque, but also kind of its own thing uh, that really happens in France and Germany and in and, and, and Western Europe. Um, but for me, it's really kind of infamous because it, I respond to its beauty, to its jewel-like detail, to the lightness, to the quality, to the way the nature comes in, to just the kind of dreamlike story nature of it that seems so appealing and, and so desirable. And it just seems like a Fragonard painting and I want to be there. And then I have to remember that this also comes right before and some say could lead into and a cause of um, the French Revolution. Um, although, of course, another way you could see it was this was just the last little glass before this generation had to pay for the generations before it. Um, but anyways, that kind of tragedy behind it, but the beauty on the surface and the romanticism of it and the intimacy of it have always been something that when I kind of set my own visual standards about, you know, what, what really makes me have a feeling of satisfaction when I finish a work is when I somehow maybe get kind of close to this. Um, and you can kind of see how some of those things have come directly in this self portrait figure here with that, that silver fabric. I mean, I think it goes directly back to that room and its decor. Um, and also this kind of sham chandelier um, with its detail, but also its droopy uh, kind of decaying nature. Um, here's flowers. Um, this is a piece, this is actually still from grad school too, um, although it is a little bit later um, and it, it's, it was such a, an intense kind of labor that I still show it. It still kind of um, amazes me that I, I somehow pulled it together back in grad school, but all this is handmade um, fab, you know, and I was just thinking a lot about why this kind of craft was so important to me, why it kind of gave me the sense of satisfaction. And, and I think there's something about the detail that mesmerizes. And so I'm really into this idea of the attraction of it, but then also I started thinking a lot about 
what the equation of time and labor plus intense consideration equals. What does it buy me in a sense, if we were to think about it and you know, what am I getting with that? And what I kind of came to think is, you know, time is kind of boiling. It's some people say, and I, I kind of prove this, that it's the one currency um, that you only have one amount of. Um, you can't, you know, you only have a certain amount of time in your life and how you use that becomes very important. And so if you use some of that precious time um, and your labor and your and your energy and you pour it into an object, what it kind of buys you is a, is a, is a bit of timelessness, but also a sense of sincerity. Um, I donated, sacrificed time, which is the highest thing I can offer in certain ways. And so because I'm offering that, you can be certain that I mean what I say, um, which kind of really, I think has become an important concept these days when truth and reality, um, especially in our culture and the political system can just be so insanely wildly varied and um, finding, you know, a locus for your interpretation of reality is becoming ever more important, um, which I guess kind of brings me in a weird way to another really big influence on my life that I think has been growing and growing and, and becoming more and more a part of my artistic conversation in the last probably five years, which is the anti Grocho, both America and Britain. Um, if I can get copies of it, there's one in Australia, but I can't get <laughs> access to it yet. Um, but I, I guess in a way it's kind of like object porn, it's like objects coming through and, and being lit and nice and you get to hear the stories about them and it's very calming and, and I don't know, fun for me to watch. And so I'm always watching Antiques Rocha when I wake up and I'm watching it when I go to sleep. And so I've been thinking, you know, what is it that's so interesting to me, so compelling to me? And I, I think there's something about the history of the found object and the way that objects can garner history, but also garner um, proximity to something that maybe we can't to fame or to infamy. Like you could, you may not be able to meet Napoleon, but you might for a lot of money be able to buy something that he owned, that he touched, which for me kind of gets into a weird wishy-washy kind of magic thing of like, you know, what really passes from Napoleon to this object that would make it be able to be worth money. This, this whole interesting, another way of looking at the way that objects and the stories around objects and the place of those objects in our lives can affect our own perception of things in a very real matter of fact way. Because the other thing that I like about Antiques Roadshow is it's so ubiquitous in America, like conservative people watch it, liberal people watch it, old people watch it, I mean, young people watch it, you know, it's very appealing and we're all kind of watching this equation of how emotions and and things of the heart and lust for craft or objects or beauty can be translated in a very real way through desire into the world of like money, which is a very concrete thing, even though it's super not concrete that we all kind of understand. So how that all that equation works and the way that math in our minds happens is, is all very interesting to me and how that in a way I think really empowers objects and, and how I can kind of work with that. Um, so this is a piece um, that I made. Uh, and I hope, I hope we're going good. For whatever reason, I can't see anybody else's camera. So um, I'm assuming I'm talking to, to people. Okay. You are. Uh, this is a piece called uh, Jacob's Ladder, um, which was at a show, one of my, my first big kind of solo shows at Conduit Gallery uh, back in 2017. Um, and this was, uh, this piece is called Jacob's Ladder. Um, and so just kind of the thing that's where, you know, coming from Antiques Roadshow is one of the things that's really happening with these ceramic figurines and stuff, um, and we can kind of see it more in these detailed things is, is the figurines and figures that you're seeing in these pieces are, are found figurines. Um, and it's very important that they be found figurines and, and found, and there's also found fabrics and, um, things that people knit, and they're all coming from the thrift store, which is kind of like, like the pound of, of objects. Like, you know, they get thrown out or cascarded away, and then you come in and I walk through and I go, does this have the personality to be reborn into something else? 
Um, and so there's kind of that thing. I, what I, I guess what I really get interested into is it, it allows me to support a habit of going and buying and collecting objects and kind of being in thrift stores and seeing what makes it a cut and what doesn't and this really basic low level decision making thing and thinking about how can I apply that back to my work. But also that all these figurines that I'm buying, all these bound fabrics and stuff like that all have whatever that energy location is to other people that I'm talking about in the Antiques Roadshow, but it's all unknown. It's all just kind of a romantic notion in my mind. But I think it's really important to me because I'm such a fan of history and history is always a building upon things. And so I think that's always been really important in my art as well, that the found object plays a huge role and that I am not ever the ultimate originator. I am a finder and an, and an adder on um, um, and recaster. Um, but I think it's something that's really important that, that the objects that they're based do not start with me totally, that they have their own histories that I am just adding into and building on top of. Um, and where I am kind of with my ceramics, it, it's kind of maybe the most um, prolific side of the practice, although kind of conceptually it, it, it kind of has a very um, smaller sector. Well, I mean, main sector, but equal to the other sculptures than it, which maybe it may, doesn't always look like in terms of like how many objects I'm, I'm turning out. Um, but where I'm kind of with them now is I've got this, this method of the found figurine with the fabric, covering it in slip, getting it fired out. Um, is really figured out and down pat. There's not a lot of questions left in it for me. And so where I am kind of now is just like trying to get much more serious and focused and considerate with what the actual forms are doing too. So that it's very much a marriage of kind of the surface plus the form and the conceptual and just kind of, which is a much slower refined process. So to kind of show that here are these two chandeliers that I made, one I made, the one on the left was made first and the one on the right was made second. Um, and you just kind of can see how the reason they're the same color is the one on the right was a commission and they wanted the same color. But you can also kind of see how I'm trying to push the form further always, adding electricity, making the different layers a little bit more pronounced or, or different, making the column a little bit taller. Um, so that's kind of where I am with the ceramics right now, which is a very interesting and, and new process to me because it, it's really kind of a, not a thing that I had so much time for in the beginning of my career, but now I'm kind of reaching and getting, I don't know, settled into it. Um, it's kind of another side. Um, so another form that you kind of can see come up is, is this clock thing, which grates directly back to time. Um, I think one of the things that I find really interesting about ceramics is that this kind of connection between the inertness of the ceramics. So if you bury ceramic in the ground, it doesn't rust, it doesn't rot. Um, it's in a, kind of in a word incorruptible. Um, so it has this potential to last indefinitely, but then it also has this other side of fragility, uh, which makes it not hermetic, not incorruptible. And so I'm always kind of interested in this one step forward, one step back that I can translate into the ceramics, which in essence kind of makes them last longer, but also makes them in another way more fragile. And this this kind of push pull and possibility game playing with kind of, you know, trying to make myself last, make the objects last, but also kind of ultimately maybe failing in the end is something that kind of really intrigues me. Um, I put these figures in here. This is also kind of a really major um, aesthetical influence for me. Uh, these are Meissen ceramics. Uh, and I think the one on the left is maybe English cold port. But this is 17th century um, porcelain. This is being made in Europe when porcelain, uh, maybe right after, right before this, this is kind of after they started inventing their own porcelain and figuring out how to make it. But there was a time where it was worth more than gold. Um, and it was tied up to tea and, and people's addiction to tea, which I think is kind of interesting. But also these things were extremely expensive in the time period. They could cost up to the equivalent of several hundred thousand dollars in our money. And they seem very bright and frivolity and they have these Rococo themes of lovers in the field or even this one here on the left, which is more militaristic. But if you had a piece of this in your house, 
they would be very political and very power oriented. People would know that one, you were wealthy enough to afford them, and two, you were in touch with the taste of the royals or whoever was in power. So um, again, just this understanding of, of kind of don't necessarily understand or judge a book by its cover. Something can be pretty and be a Trojan horse and still have uh, in a certain context, a hell of a lot of power and a hell of a lot of meaning and a hell of a lot of um, impact on people's lives. Um, this is kind of a piece we kind of a Kanye base for, and this is actually the piece that um, just went into the Crystal Bridges collection. Um, you can kind of see how those forms are related there. But also, this is a bit of a Frankenstein piece. Um, and I think that it again speaks something about how, you know, like things happen and, 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 and a lot of me is the art is reacting to them and kind of seeing where we get on the other side. So this piece um, was never meant to have these colored flowers in it. I was just going to have a really kind of beautiful white and gold classic thing. And then when you fire these things, they have to go through two, two firings. There's a bisque in which the clay gets fired for the first time and all the fabric and everything non-ceramic gets fired out. And then there's the glaze firing. Um, well, when it came out of the bus firing, yada, 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 it fell flat on its face when I was trying to get it out of the kiln for <laughs> a number of stupid reasons. And a lot of things broke and a lot of things came off and I was working at a residency so I didn't have a lot of time and I just, you know, I had a choice, do I throw it away or do I pick up the pieces and move on? And so in my mind, it, it had a lot of holes. So I went and glazed it and said, okay, what do I have? And I thought, well, I can just fill them with other flowers and I'll just glue them in place and we'll just see what happens. Let's give it a shot. Um, and I think it, it kind of spawned a whole year of work and became one of my first pieces to get collected into a major collection. And so, um, again, yeah, I just think this rolling with the punches and, and respond, you know, and how people respond and build upon the things that happen from chance and how that gets reflected in history and how it can kind of reflect that history and these things that I'm making. Um, this was kind of a really interesting way that, that all came together. So something that's been kind of happening in my work a lot lately um, is I've been trying to think and kind of focus on death and the way that we design around it and, and work with it through kind of the objects we've made, maybe not so much now, but in the past, really kind of interest me um, because I would go to these cemeteries. This is a big giant cemetery called Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. Um, and it's huge and it has just these major buildings and 30 foot obelisks and all these things that were just built for individual memorials. Um, and I got really interested in it because um, there's a lot of hubris and a lot of stuff going on there and a lot of displaying of family wealth and those kind of things which which are interesting and not not interesting not really what i was interested in but i also was when i kind of started stripping away this idea of having an object take on your you know replace your actual physical presence on the world become in essence a representation of you in a very final way and, 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 and an object that looks like it doesn't have any purpose on the surface that actually has maybe one of the most challenging and endearing challenge of all, which is just simply to say, I existed. Um, and the different ways that that could happen. And, and there was something about how all this would happen a lot more in the Victorian times and they were much more in line with death. Um, and the way that we had seen kind of distance from it in our more digital culture was really interesting to me and, and maybe something worth re-looking at and re bringing back. One, because it was a really interesting kind of formal repository of just interesting forms that, that seemed weird and anachronistic that I could kind of take and play with and have room to do that with. Um, and then also it seemed to have everything to do with all those anti drozo stories that I was having about proximity and representation and having objects be representing people and all that kind of stuff. Um, and also maybe re-looking at ways that monuments could be divorced from physical forms of people um, so that perhaps they could have longer lives uh, and, and be more representatives for more people. Like maybe instead of having the body, we could just have flowers 
a permanent way and, and know what that means. Um, this is kind of a, which I'm still not to the bottom of that, but it was just something that I was kind of thinking and still thinking on. Um, this is kind of a shot of actually what the things look like before they get fired, where you can kind of see how it's all just found flowers and trim and all that kind of stuff. And this is just covered up with slip and fired out. And, and they start to kind of look like this. This is another kind of tombstone form. Um, and I, this kind of question of death and dealing with death and how death could be dealt with in design and, and, and also coming into being a ceramic teacher and having to think more directly about what is ceramics, what does it stand for, what is its history, what is its purpose in a more kind of direct, responsible way um, got me thinking about how it really was no concession at all to make functional objects as long as you got interesting with what the function was. Um, and so kind of, and I think we're kind of in a town where death is so much more on our minds because of mass killings and white supremacy that causes a lot of death and the deaths from disease and possibilities of death from environmental disasters that we cause, you know, this, I think there was a time during the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s where we, we just did not see the limits and now we're, we're really coming into terms with with limits and ends of things and people dying and that being important to us and being a conversation in our lives again in a way that maybe it wasn't so much in years past. And what is art gonna do? <laughs> How can we design for this and, and accommodate this, this change? Um, and I think it was just to kind of rethink what those things can do, rethink the places that they can be in our lives. Um, rethinking the play I don't know this this basket was also made kind of you know expanding where that could be because as much as I love flowers and I love cut flowers it kind of occurred to me one day that when you when you cut a flower and put it in a vase you're in essence kind of having a traumatic death play <laughs> because the flower will slowly kind of fade and die in front of you when you know that the minute that you cut that flower that you're putting a kind of timeline on that flower and so if you think about it in that way, even things like a flower basket with covered in thrill, you know, not thrill, frills could be a kind of gothic um, momentous thing. Um, and another place I was thinking about it was kind of in these urns, uh, making them things that were aesthetically beautiful, interesting, and also could have other um, functions. So this is an urn uh, specifically for a pet and parent. So inside the urn, there are two uh, compartments. One is kind of smaller than the other one. So if you have one pet and you want yourself, you can be in the larger one and the pet can be in the smaller one. Or if you have a thousand, you know, five dogs, then maybe all the dogs go in the big one and you can go in the small one. But, you know, just thinking about who and how we want to spend our afterlives and who goes with us and how that memory can be kept on and carried on. Um, has been something that I've been really thinking about and was thinking about before the pandemic happened and before um, all the deaths of the people last summer and just all the deaths that we've been having so too much of lately. Um, I don't know, just made me feel like I should keep going on that. So that's always, that's something that's happening a lot in the studio now. Um, kind of moving on from the ceramics, another kind of thing that goes on the work is a lot of installation things. And so when I'm kind of thinking about that, again, I do go back to the 17th century kind of European aesthetics. But this is actually a very interesting case. This is this is the house of a person um, named um, Ludwig II, who made a lot of fairy tale castles. He made um, one of his castles, which I can't remember the name, um, uh, is the is the the basis and the model for the, the Disneyland castle um, in California. And um, when you look at this image, what's going on with this guy is, um, there used to be a time in Europe where Germany and a lot of the other kind of those countries were not one solid country. There were a lot of many municipalities and they were kind of called the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and then, so there was the Kingdom of Bavaria and there was, you know, Prussia and all these different things. And they all had their own kings and their own, and their own you know, power locuses and all those kind of things. And, and this person, Louis the Second, came right in, right after all those countries become united, um, and their 
there's one leader who is not him. <laughs> and so he's kind of a, he becomes for the first time in his family, a leader who has money and a stipend and a title, but does not have any kind of actual physical power. Um, and um, he can't really handle it. He's got a lot of mental problems anyways. And uh, he um, uses this money to make these fairy tale castles. And, he, and the other thing is, is he never invited anybody into these castles. He was actually very afraid of other people. So he's making these castles, which are really, in my mind, the expressions of the power that he felt he should have had, but did not. And also the message is, is really for nobody but him. And when you look at this aesthetic here, it's grand, it feels like Versailles, but there's just something too much. The gold is too thick. It's almost claustrophobic. It's maybe the scale of the room's a little bit too small and there's just a little bit too much gilding. And so when you really start to look at this image and spend some time with this image, you begin to start to feel that the mental illness underneath it, you know, that maybe it's not just a kind of political, you know, stance of, of, of grandeur. It's kind of the flailings of a man who doesn't know how to deal with his decline. Um, and I couldn't help but not think about that room in context to this room, which is the penthouse apartment of Donald Trump uh, in New York, um, which in my mind has kind of the same things. It has all the symbols of richness, gold, marble, um, detailed carvings, glitter, glam, um, but it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel natural. It feels like a band-aid um, and not an expression of legitimate or actual power. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about, you know, how, how you can see something on the surface, but then when you spend time with it, you start to realize that the essence of the thing is not what you thought it was. Um, and so I've been making a lot of these series and these kind of installations, which is just a whole bunch of different objects. Um, collected that are kind of along a similar color scheme of gold and black um, that equal uh, nothing. Um, there's nothing underneath them that is any kind of structure. Everything that this is built up on is just boxes and chairs <laughs> that's just covered with fabric and has objects stepped onto it. So it's just kind of thinking about the aesthetics and the surface of things and how I can make something that drew you in um, and had all the power of the glitz and the glamour of it, but then, you know, could could also fall apart under kind of certain, like, you know, closer um, consideration. Um, and I think this is not actually a new thing in history, but where I'm trying to go with it, and, and you can kind of see this maybe a little bit more in these, these things with my body where I'm making these self-portraits. So this is a Roman, copy of a Greek sculpture um, and for a long time was considered kind of the perfection of Western beauty, both artistic terms and I guess sexual terms and, and uh, political terms, whatever, however you want to take it, a guy named Binkelmann who um, was a closet homosexual kind of fell in love with this sculpture and then promoted it um, and, and also promoted along with a lot of, kind of unrealistic standards. Um, so I have been thinking, you know, these things have been so long and, and I want to compare kind of directly with them. And so I, I make these kind of, uh, and still making a series of these beaded portraits um, where I kind of face the poses off these classical statues that idealize bodies from the Greek myths and, and put what, what I consider not the idealized body, at least in culture. And, and there came a time when I was maybe not so positive about my body. I wasn't really sure what to do with it. I was dealing with a lot of like, who am I and where do I fit in the gay community? And I, this was during grad school and I was learning and growing a lot and not see and, you know, getting, getting familiarized for the first time for the no fat stems or Asians. Kind of, I like what I like politics of like the gay world and, and dealing with that and trying to find love for my own body and, and um, 
confidence in my own body, and so I was thinking a lot about Gothic works that had all these gems that pilgrims would bring, and then they would take all these gems and they would build reliquaries, and and slowly but surely, one gem by one gem, they would they would honor these things that had this ultimate kind of preciousness in their religious life. And so I thought, well, maybe I can replicate that thing for my body, so that I be one bead of a precious stone at a time, learning the outline of my body one bead at a time, kind of honoring it one bead at a time, and building it up just the same way they might build a reliquary in, in, a, in a Gothic church. Um, and so they kind of becoming like records of my body, like every two, sometimes two to five years, I'll make one of these. Um, and this is the very last one, which was made in 2016, um, kind of right as Donald Trump was coming in. And um, yeah, and this is taken from Michelangelo, um, one of the damn souls going in. And so it's kind of a record of where I'm thinking in my body and where I'm kind of at mentally at the time. Um, and so my next kind of project for that is working. And it's a bit of drawing too. Drawing comes in and out. I'm always interested in how drawing can come in in a very sculptural context so because i do look a lot at painting and i'm always going to learn how that comes in you can kind of see in these photographs where i'm like wearing works and doing things like that um dealing with decadence and indulgence um i'm trying to hurry up because i know i'm running low on time but um one of the other things that i'm kind of thinking about i think it's been a main kind of presence going on in the work now is is this idea of kind of protection and projection and how those two things work a lot especially in queer or other bodies um, and where I just feel like there's a lot, like thinking kind of back to Ru's, RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, in the early seasons, they would always have this thing where they'd kind of be like, you know, tell us about your confidence and also tell us about how drag kind of helped you overcome. And all these people would have all these stories about how they, you know, were not accepted in their, in their lives or their families because they were queer and they were femme and they were not meeting standards and all this kind of stuff and how drag through this alternate persona, this surface character, um, allow them to gain actual confidence <laughs> and um, and kind of like science fiction does for us, create ways to see the futures that they wanted to, to have. Um, and at the same time, these things were also kind of protections, still protecting the kind of scarred, maybe queer other person in their soul. And so I was thinking, you know, wh how can objects maybe equal that? And so I've got this mask here that um, is made out of golden orchids, which I always kind of consider to be, um, for me, a, a metaphor for queerness because orchids seem exotic in, in, um, in other and from elsewhere and um, very kind of like a hothouse flower, not exactly weak, but, but I don't know. You know, not you know, not not a rose is another way of saying it. Not not your standard typical typicality of American beauty, but yet it um, was at the same time everywhere and can grow on a rock. It doesn't even have to have soil to grow. You know, like how amazing is that? How powerful is that? Um, so for me, they've always kind of been a symbol of beauty. And so this was a thing that where you could both hide yourself, but both project the beauty at the same time. Um, and we kind of see this happen again, maybe the body, you know, becoming flowers and so projecting beauty, not actually getting physical protection, but more of like a mental projection and protection. And I've been trying to push this thing further and further with, with the body kind of almost becoming flowers and maybe merging finally two things where the, where the body and the still life become one. And some ways that's most recently kind of happened is um, I was, found a World War II helmet in a thrift store one day and I, I just kind of took it and was wondering, you know, what I could do with it. And I started kind of looking at images of soldiers and I would see like these sniper images. And I was really struck by them because on the surface of them, they, they're very masculine. They're very, <laughs> um, I don't know, they feel very proud boy to me in, in, in the kind of way. But then if I look at the elements of them, they feel like almost like a floral arrangement that somebody's wearing. And so I was just, for me, they had a real interesting kind of um, dynamic going on there. This thing that I was super unfamiliar with, which was war and war games and proud boys. But the other thing that I was really familiar with, which was flowers and flower arranging and the beauty of nature. And so I thought, well, maybe I can make a ghillie suit, a sniper suit for a queer person. So again, using the golden orchid and kind of making um, a 
really suit in my own that of gold. Um, goldness that kind of blends into a fabulous background um, of showing kind of my future hope for where we will be uh, in the value of society one day. Um, another thing that's been really new and kind of interesting with the, with the subject that I've been tackling much more directly is the idea of jewelry. Um, and, and the reason I'm kind of getting to it is because um, Adornment has always been a really important to the work. The work is always about putting layers of things on and, and building things up and making things look like they need to look on the surface. And so I think what's interesting about jewelry is, again, taking out the middleman and, and making the body be the canvas that I'm trying to upgrade in a more direct way. Um, this is the most recent piece called a Fear of Death Mask. It's made out of shells that are fossilized that are about 200 million years old. And I've been wanting to make a piece of them for about 10 years because they fascinate me, because I can't, I can pick them up off the ground and have a thing that came from 200 million years ago that was alive. And, and just trying to think about how impossible it was for me to understand the distance of time that 200 million years is and how I couldn't understand it physically and yet it was collapsed and I held this thing in my hand. And it took me many years to kind of figure out what it was, but I guess it, it gave me a calming thing because I, I thought about everything that had lived and died, all the civilizations that we know and don't even know about. You know, the earth has risen and collapsed in kind of biology four or five times in between me and this shell. And, and in a way it kind of makes me be a little bit less scared of death in my own life. So I thought it's kind of based off a form of death mask from cultures all over the world, from Mesoamerica and China and Egypt, um, all have this kind of um, tradition of putting masks on, on top of the dead um, for a lot of different reasons. But I thought this was a piece for when you were feeling overwhelmed or, or overwhelmed by the anxiety of death for a lot of the reasons I just talked about, you could put on this mask, think about 200 million years and maybe get some relief um, and then just quickly this is this is kind of a more live performance thing that is the kind of strangest part of my practice and, and kind of the most exciting part of my practice and the part of the practice that I know the least about what it's doing but again um, it's all about I think in this point of time about trying to make more intersections cut out more middlemen and say what happens if I become the figurine in the ceramic piece, um, making my own world. And so this is me kind of in a live action way, copying forms of Greek sculptures that agent, that were slowed down and made kind of ambiguous in, their, in, the, in the time that they're taking that eventually kind of makes its way to a full reclining kind of death pose. Uh, and that was kind of the first one of the, oh, oh, sorry. One more thing. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about just taking the body out of the equation and how the body can be represented by flowers or objects. And so my very last thing here is to look at this painting by a guy named Hyacinth Rigaud. You probably know him because he painted the very famous painting of Louis the Sixteenth with the high heels and the robe and all this kind of stuff. And what I really liked about this portrait was this is a very noble man. It's not a French noble, but it's a very highly regarded noble person. And um, the only thing that the, that the artist would have painted in person would have been the head and the hands. And everything else in this portrait would have just been made up fantasy put on a model. And what I like about this is like, you know, with Instagram and all these things, it's so important that our bodies be represented in the world and that we kind of stay to them. But what I like about this, it's almost like a digital fantasy of like, he's just being, letting the artist project him into this fantasy. And he's not worried at all that his actual body is not being represented. His actual body is just kind of being transformed into flowing fabric. And that that denotes wealth and power and that that's what he wants you to know. Not where he physically is or what he physically comes from. And so I just been kind of really getting to that, interested into that aspect and how that could come into these figurines. And so this is one of my most recent kind of performance pieces, which I'm planning on showing at Mint Solomon, um, where I kind of made a clay version of that painting that I could just kind of step in and exist in. And that it's just there's nothing really happening. 
in the video, just like just me existing in this world and just being there and, and kind of imagining feeling it and seeing what that's like and feeling mighty real. Um, because I think one of the things that I've been kind of thinking about so much about the work is about surfaces and false and true. And I think so often, you know, like, and how surfaces can be used to deceive. And I think so oftentimes we kind of think about that in a negative concept of, of, of things being used to trick other people and take them away. But I'm like, what if we can use that in, pos you know, in a positive way to where we can pretend and make surfaces of what we want to be in the future that although they're not real now, could be real one day. And that the dreaming is important to know where you're going is sometimes the journey. And so I'm thinking a lot more about that and how that works. Okay. That's a lot. I'm sorry, I went over time, Angelique. Oh no, don't be sorry. <laughs> Deep breath, right? I'm sure you could go for another hour. Um, I, I do have some questions that we've gotten, so I'd like to just go ahead with these before we're, before we're done. Um, I'm going to start with this one. Thanks for sharing your work. I'm interested to hear more about your performances. Can you point us to other talks or interviews where you spend more time on these? Um, I know time is almost up here, so is, is there any way you could give us some, some other, other places where people could look, look, look some of this up, if there are videos or... Uh, well, uh, all the all the performances that have been done so far are on my website, so you can see them there. Um, as for more talking about them, there's not a lot because I, I'm never exactly sure how I feel about them, and that's kind of why they're so exciting and so scary for me because I still don't know what they mean, but I know that I need to make them, <laughs> so that's where I am with those. Okay, and you're going to do you're going to do more uh, coming up at Mindy Solomon. You're going to Redo that. Well, I wanna, yeah, I want to show that video that I showed you, Minnie Solomon. It's actually never been presented in any kind of gallery space yet, even though it's actually kind of a couple of years old. So I'm hoping to show it at Minnie Solomon. But also, I'm thinking and kind of planning about how that setup could be used, but maybe instead of videos, doing it in photographs, so they can be more closely linked to those original kind of source paintings. Okay. Um, and I have a couple of a couple of others here. Uh, what, what's the biggest challenge that artists face today, and what advice do you have for art students? Uh, the biggest problem, challenge that you guys face is how many there are of you, um, and the, how do you rise and grow and find some light for yourself when there's so many artists being put out there and i think the secret to that is perseverance and a lot of self-faith and confidence and understanding that it is a long game and not a short game so instead of thinking about putting everything in your life depending on what happens in the next year or two years remember that if you're in it for the long haul and you really want to do the artist thing it might be a 40 50 60 year game that you got to think yeah, I that is that is good advice. And there's one more here. Why did you name it Jacob's Ladder? Um, <laughs> um, I was really interested in the idea of Jacob's Ladder is kind of a story from the Bible, but also it's kind of a a, a trope in cinema where. Um, you see a drama and you believe it to be real, and then later you realize that it was all a dream. And so I got really interested in that idea of, of, of fantasies being realities and not being true and just getting lost in the murk of that. So I think those kind of ceramic pieces and their kind of unbelievable detail, kind of fantasy and fragility existing on that dirty, rotten wood that I dug from an old fort was kind of the, the, uh, that kind of push and pull. Yeah, okay. Um. I think that's it for the questions. I wish I wish we could see just another hour's worth of stuff, but I believe we're probably at at our at our time limit. I would love like to thank you again, Anthony, for uh, sharing all your work with us, and I I can't wait to see more. And hopefully, um, we will uh, we'll get a chance to very soon. Okay. I think the next comment show is in the fall of twenty two. So okay, and that again. Uh, 
but soon enough. <laughs> and it'll be a solo show? Yeah. Okay. And for those of y'all who didn't understand what he just said, his, his next show in the in Dallas at Conduit Gallery will be, and you said, in, in the fall of 22. So, and about it. Yeah, October right now. In about a year and a half. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. And you, you have so many other things on your plate for this upcoming year, so we, we wish you uh, the best with getting, getting it all taken care of. Yeah, and thank and you. The best way to keep track is just follow me on Instagram. It's how I keep track of my own life. So. <laughs> and, and I do, yes. Okay, so thank you. Um, I think that, are we? All right, well, thanks for joining us again. I'm, I'm, well, thanks again for this was fantastic. I'm glad I could be here. Yeah, I, I, uh, I just want to see more. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe you can invite me back next year. I'll have more to talk about. <laughs> yes, and maybe in person, which would be really wonderful. Yeah. Okay. All right. Y'all have a good one. You too. And I, let me just say thank you.